three, count them, three new APS-C lenses for the Sony ZV-E10 and A6000 series. We got the 10 to 20 millimeter f4, wow, 11 millimeter f1.8, wow, and 15 millimeter f1.4. Oh my god. These are fast, ultra wide angle lenses that we've been desperately needing for the last few years, and now, they're finally coming. All three of these lenses here come in at less than half a pound each, all souped up with the latest autofocus technology, and all of them does not have optical steady shot. Oh no! Lots of new lenses here, a lot of new information, so we'll get the most important one in this video first, and in the future, I'll focus on each of these individual lenses for their own separate videos. Comment down below which of these three you want me to focus on first. Plus, uh, your boy is supposed to be on vacation right now. I'm in Bali, but I still gotta get this video out. <laughs> And shoutouts to Aaron and Rizal from Lens Me Films for helping us out with this video, and Squarespace for sponsoring a portion of this video. So let me go ahead and give you guys the Jason Vaughn quickie wiki. For photography only, I would highly recommend the 11mm f1.8. It's the widest, fastest, ultra wide angle prime lens that can autofocus for Sony APS-C. And I can see this being really popular for astrophotographers, amongst many other things. For hybrid shooters, people who do both photos and videos, I know you guys are going to be asking me, how does this lens, this 10 to 20 power zoom here, stack up against the Tamron 11 to 20 f2.8? And again, I would try to do a more dedicated comparison in the near future. However, Tamron still has that advantage, right? That f2.8. If you value that, get the Tamron. But if you're simply looking for something light and wide, and you don't mind the f4, then take a look at this 10 to 20 millimeter power zoom lens. It's literally half the size and weight of the Tamron. Moving on, we have the 15 millimeter f1.4 G lens. And again, I know a lot of people are gonna be wanting a comparison between this and the Sigma 16 millimeter f1.4. I would do a more dedicated comparison in the near future. However, if you have the Sigma already, there is no reason to switch over unless you've been finding the Sigma to be too front heavy. Same deal, the Sony version is nearly half the size and weight of the Sigma. Now, if you have neither of these lenses and you want one of them, I would urge you to take a look at the 15 millimeter first. Now, for those who are looking to do more videos and vlogging specifically with these lenses, if you are vlogging with a camera with no in-body image stabilization, and I'm not talking about the electronic active stabilization feature found in the ZV-E10, then I would urge you to pick up a used 10 to 18 millimeter f4 version one instead. That has built-in optical lens stabilization to combat the handheld shakes. You won't have to utilize active stabilization and get forced into that heavy crop. Keeps things nice and wide for you. However, if you absolutely want the new new and you have the ZV-E10, then you will want to get either the 10 to 20 or the 11 millimeter. With the active crop, it will still fit your whole head in frame while you're vlogging. Of course, if you have a camera with in-body image stabilization, then you really have nothing to worry about. Either of these lenses here are going to be a fantastic choice for an A6600 or an A6500. However, I would personally recommend the 11mm f1.8. It's the most exciting to me. It's the widest, fastest, ultra-wide angle prime lens that can autofocus for the APS-C. And it's incredibly light, especially for low-light, light gimbal work. This is the dream lens for APS-C users and even for A7 IV users who want an ultra wide angle lens for 4K 60p due to that crop. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the look and feel of these lenses. I cannot emphasize how light these lenses are. They pair up perfectly with the APS-C setup. No front drag whatsoever, perfectly balanced setup, and it just feels really comfortable in the hands. Now, they do feel plasticky, but they're all dust and moisture resistant. All three are equipped with two extreme dynamic linear motors, which means fast and silent autofocusing, especially with the 11 and 15 millimeter tracking at wide open aperture. It's gonna keep up with your subjects really well. So let's talk about them individually. Let's start off with the 10 to 20 millimeter F4. This is a power zoom lens, which can be a good or a bad thing. We'll start off with the good first. It's all internal zooming. So if you were to use this on a gimbal, it won't shift the balance of your setup too much when you zoom. We also have the zoom lever on the ZV-E10 itself. So it's nice to have more lenses that can actually take advantage of it. Otherwise, the lens has its own zoom lever here on the side, or you can just use the zoom ring. And because it's a power zoom lens, you can adjust the speed and it will be very consistent as you zoom. And the focal length does not get reset when the camera powers off. So let's say you left it at 15 millimeter on the lens. The moment you power it back on, it will be at 15 millimeter. Moving on to the potentially bad thing. If you enjoy snap zooming as in twisting the barrel to get an immediate punch in, yeah, you won't get that with this lens. 
The zoom is controlled electronically, so you can twist the zoom ring, but it still needs the camera to tell it how much. So you can't exactly pre-zoom before you power on the camera, and you will likely not remember what focal length you left it at if you changed it from a previous usage. A feedback I would have for Sony for these power zoom lenses is that I would like it to constantly display in camera what focal length I'm in. I have accidentally shot at 35 millimeter thinking I'm at 16 millimeter the whole time with the brand new 16 to 35 millimeter power zoom lens for the full frame. Another bummer thing about this, and this is just for a very small group of full frame users, with the previous 10 to 18 f4, we could have still used that lens in full frame mode. We could zoom in a little to get out of the vignetting, which was incredibly advantageous to keep all of our megapixels while still using a light APS-C wide lens. With this new one, Unfortunately, we can't do that. But not really a big deal. Again, it's only for a small group of full frame users who still want to use their OG 10 to 18 millimeter, which by the way, came out nearly nine years ago. So this is an upgrade that we sorely been needing. While I didn't bring the OG one to compare with me, I can immediately tell this new one here has much better image quality, particularly in the corners. The previous one is already pretty small and light, but with this new one here, they managed to make it even smaller and lighter. 6.2 ounces. That's it's ridiculous. Moving on to the 11mm f1.8, and this, again, is the most exciting one out of the bunch because we've been severely lacking fast ultra-wide angle APS-C prime lenses for years now. So now that we have 11mm f1.8, finally, finally, finally! So Sony is giving us two options here, right? We can either go with the flexibility of the zoom with the 10 to 20 or straight up go to the 1.8 11 millimeters here for low light. Now, this is the only lens out of the three that is not a G lens, which is kind of awkward and kind of funny at the same time. It's a little hard to tell on camera, but the exterior material of the 11 millimeter is a little different from the G lenses. Also, obviously no aperture ring like the 15 millimeter G here. So a little basic on the outside, but on the inside, the performance is up there along with the other two lenses. Plus, it's slightly less expensive compared to the 10 to 20 millimeter power zoom. So if I had to choose between the two, I would recommend the 11 millimeter all the way. Moving on to the 15 millimeter f 1.4 G, and I really want to call this a baby 24 G master. If someone else causes a baby 24 G master, let me know in the comments down below and we'll go riding in the comment section, okay? I'm just kidding. I mean, how can you not, right? This gives us a full frame equivalent of roughly 22.5 millimeter. Plus it's a 1.4. It has an aperture ring and a click list option as well. It's kind of cute. I mean, it, it's basically a 24 G Master baby, right? Now, a lot of people are really going to be looking at this and wonder how it stacks up against the Sigma 16 millimeter F1.4, which has been out since like, what, 2017, about five years ago. And I'll see if I can do a full comparison when I return to the States. But 100% as of right now, it is half the weight of the Sigma, which is crazy to say for APS-C. Normally for full frame lenses, half the weight is a significant difference between two similar lenses. And the Sigma 16 16 millimeter is small. However, if you own and used one, no doubt it's a pretty hefty, dense lens. And you will feel the front drag, especially if you use it with a super light APS-C body like an A6100. This one here, not so much. It feels really balanced even with the ZV-E10. Now, I'm not saying to drop your Sigma and get the Sony, right? If you have the Sigma already, just keep using the Sigma. I don't think you'll notice a huge performance boost unless you really value that weight difference. In that case, the Sony 15 here is incredibly light. However, However, if you own neither of those lenses, but you are looking for a lens like this, then I would urge you to look at the 15 millimeter from Sony first. However, it is important to note that neither of these new lenses here have built-in lens stabilization. No optical steady shot. Now, usually I'm not this hard when it comes to new lenses not having optical steady shot, right? Particularly some of the newer full frame ones because full frame bodies have built in body stabilization. So it does all the heavy lifting when it comes to stability. However, when it comes to the APS-C line, there are quite a bit of cameras that don't have built in body stabilization, which is going to be a huge factor to look at when considering these lenses. A6600, A6500 or any full frame users, I mean, you have have nothing to worry about. I mean, just go ahead and take your pick on any of these lenses here. But if you have a camera that does not have in-body image stabilization, you're gonna need to be careful. If you're looking to vlog or do a lot of handheld video work, you might wanna still consider the old 10 to 18 millimeter F4 version one, which does have optical steady shot. 
For the ZVE-10, yes, you can get away with using the active stabilization, but remember, it crops in a lot. However, with the 10 to 20 or the 11 millimeter, it's still gonna be enough to fit your whole head into frame. At this point now, I am really hoping the next batch of APS-C cameras that will be coming out that Sony will put in-body image stabilization in those cameras. It's great that these lenses are getting lighter and smaller, but we really need the bodies to have in-body image stabilization to do that heavy lifting when it comes to stability, because otherwise these are very exciting lenses. Of course, a lot of the need of optical steady shot can be circumvented if you plan on using a gimbal, which all of these lenses here are perfect for light gimbals like the Zhiyun Crane M3. And boy, let me tell you, it is a dream. In particular, with the 10 to 20, again, it's a power zoom lens, so you can get a variety of different focal length without wrecking the balance of your setup. For my OG A6000 users, I see you guys in a corner over there shaking your canes, wondering if these lenses are gonna be good for the A6000 because you're still holding out for that body upgrade. The answer is 1000% yes. Especially the 11 and 15 millimeter, they will revitalize a lot of life into the A6000. Despite being eight years old, good glass will always make an old camera feel like a brand new one. Especially when it comes to photography, the A6000 can still go on for another while longer. For videos, especially if you don't need 4K immediately right now, invest in one of these lenses, get yourself a gimbal, and you can still achieve some amazing results. 1080p 60 frames per second is still really good and still really relevant today. Again, I'll be doing a dedicated video for each of these individual lenses. Head to the community tab to vote which one you want to see first. I'll have a link to that in the description box below as well as the pinned comment here on top. But just to give some concluding words, was Sony kind of late on this? It's been a while since we saw any new APS-C lenses from them, the last being the 16 to 55 and the 75 to 350G lenses back in 2019, which we desperately needed. However, we were also sorely needing ultra wide angle lenses, fast ultra wide angle lenses for a very long time now, especially those who switched to Sony APS-C for vlogging within the last few years. Again, if we think about it, it's been nearly nine years since the OG 10 to 18 F4. So, was Sony late on this? Depends where you're standing from. If you're part of the Tamron and Sigma group, then yes, Sony was very late on this. However, I would argue they didn't slack. The fact that these lenses are way lighter than the competition proves that they are worth taking a look at, especially when you're comparing the Sigma 16mm with the Sony 15mm. They are five years apart, which is an adequate amount of time to see something similar, but also an upgrade in the market. But in a few years time, it wouldn't matter which came out first because all of these are gonna be options on the shelf. So new users would just have to watch a Jason Vong video to choose the best one for themselves. Guys, thank you so much for watching. If you guys enjoy this video and want to support the channel, stick around and listen to what my sponsor Squarespace has to say. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to create beautiful websites. No coding knowledge whatsoever. Perfect for people like me because I just want to make YouTube videos for you guys and not have to worry about coding my entire website. Simply just select one of their templates to get started. Every aspect is easily customizable with their drag and drop feature. Whether you're in need of a portfolio, an e-commerce store, or even a simple blog, design it with Squarespace. Use my link down below to test it out. And when you're ready to launch your first website or domain, use my code Jason Vong to save 10% off. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.